Three days before Christmas in the Philadelphia suburbs, housewife Ellen Robb was wrapping gifts at her kitchen table. Only a few hours after her husband had left for work, he returned home and found her murdered, still with gifts sitting out. She was on the kitchen floor. A broken window and her husband's extensive alibi led to an obvious conclusion. This was a burglary that had gone wrong. But was there more to this story than meets the eye? Hi everyone, I'm Kevin and this is Just Thought Lounge. At JTL, we deliver serious, well-balanced coverage of the cases that really make you think. If that sounds like your type of true crime, then you've come to the right place. Today's case takes a look at what happens when a killer tries to outsmart an investigation. And when all is said and done, you can be the judge of how well that worked out. Let's take a look. Ellen Gregory was born in Syracuse, New York, but grew up in Rosemont in Pennsylvania. In her youth, Ellen was an extroverted and fun-loving student, friend, and sister. After studying retail and design at college, she launched a career as a retail manager. In the late 1980s, the vivacious and youthful Ellen met a man a few years her senior, who seemed in many ways to be her exact opposite in temperament and personality. Introverted and academic, Raphael Robb was already a well-established economist. A native of Israel and very well-traveled, Raphael earned his doctorate at the University of California in the late 70s. His specialization was game theory, the study of decision-making. Usually, his expertise was applied to predicting consumer decisions. The academic worked as a consultant to some of the world's largest corporations and even on occasion, national governments. It was his job to assess every detail of a situation, predict how others would respond, and create strategies to win in any circumstance. Raphael held a tenured position as a professor in economics and game theory at the University of Pennsylvania. In 1990, the introverted professor proposed to the outgoing and energetic Ellen Gregory, and she said yes. It was a second marriage for Raphael, Ellen's first. After a few years, the marriage was off to a rocky start. Ellen, nonetheless, became pregnant. The couple's daughter, Olivia, was the center of their world. As Christmas time approached in the winter of 2006, she was 12 years old. On the 22nd of December, Raphael placed a call to the Marion Police Department. It was just before 2 p.m. He had arrived home to find Ellen, his wife of 16 years, dead on the kitchen floor. Bizarrely, given the circumstances, but typical for Raphael, he calmly explained to the officer that he had arrived home and found his wife murdered on the floor. Officer Markland of the Marion Police asked if she was killed and how he could be certain. Raphael's response was definitive. I know, he said. Her head is cracked. He confirmed that no one else was there, but mentioned a broken window that he had spotted in the back of the house. Someone must have broken in. When officers arrived at the house on Forest Road, there was a lot to take in. The crime scene was horrific. It was the Montgomery County Detective Bureau that handled homicides for the region. There were not a lot of these types of violent crimes to investigate in the high-end suburb of Upper Marion. However, the veteran detectives from the county had mostly spent their careers elsewhere, including Philadelphia and other major cities. Collectively, they had been exposed to and investigated thousands of homicides. The consensus of these experts when they saw the brutal scene was clear. Ellen Robb had been shot likely with a high-powered rifle or a shotgun to the head. This conclusion was drawn largely from the unsettling amount of damage that had been inflicted on the wife and mother. Christmas wrapping and accessories sitting nearby gave away her activity in the moments before her death. She was preparing gifts for the holidays. Bloody footprints led from near to Ellen in the kitchen out through to the garage, where they abruptly ceased suggesting the killer's path to exit the house. 
A side door had glass busted through from the exterior, just as Raphael had noted on his call to the police department. The nature of the lock meant that an intruder could have reached through the broken window and opened the doorknob from the inside to gain access. Then there was the state of the rest of the house. Boxes, piles of them, stacked upon each other, floor to ceiling, with narrow paths cut out to connect one room to the next. The lack of space was stifling, and the number of objects overwhelming. Almost everything appeared to be new purchases. Unopened packages of homeware items, cosmetics, and everything else, mostly purchased from the internet. The extensive search did not turn up any bloody clothing or a murder weapon. And with the house in this cluttered state, it was difficult to determine if anything was missing. The home did not appear to have been ransacked, there were certainly items in plain view that a burglar could have taken. That nothing had clearly been stolen was not the only oddity in Raphael Robb's claim that a burglar-turned-killer had made his way into the home. Ellen's vehicle, a second-hand Subaru, was parked in the drive. This would have served as a sign to any potential thief that someone was at home. Curiously, directly across the street, there was no car in the drive, and a UPS package left in plain view by the front door, an indication that no one was at home, only one property adjacent. Why choose the Rob house to break into? The broken glass from the door window had shattered across the floor inside the house. It was scattered across the hallway leading into the rest of the house, but it appeared undisturbed. The glass was not crushed underfoot, no one had walked on it to get into the house. Raphael had entered through the garage, and the front door remained unlocked. Raphael Robb's story was suspicious, and his behavior to investigators did not help ease their skepticism. Raphael reportedly calmly explained to investigators how he had last seen his wife that morning before leaving for work at the university. Then, without tears or emotion, he told them about walking into the kitchen to find her dead upon his return. Raphael was first questioned at the Montgomery County Hospital, where he was taken after complaining of anxiety. His clothing was taken, a DNA sample provided, and his hands were tested for gunshot residue. All of this was done without complaint or reservation. A small speck of blood was noticeable on his right hand. He had approached his wife and touched her face when he first came upon her, he recalled. The professor remained externally calm and collected, and he was extremely cooperative. His initial questioning lasted a full 12 hours, during which time he answered every question posed to him and never requested legal counsel. He refused, however, to take a polygraph test, insisting that due to his anxiety, he would likely fail. By this time, detectives had been informed of Raphael's background, including his expertise in game theory. If he was trying to outsmart them, they were ready. A team was out verifying every aspect of his story and every detail of his alibi in real time. Meanwhile, they asked him to outline exactly where he had been that day up to the moment he found Ellen in the kitchen. After dropping Olivia at school that morning around 8.30, the professor returned home where Ellen was busy wrapping Christmas gifts. He told detectives that he left at roughly 9.20 to go to a food market where he made a purchase at a fruit stand. From the market, Raphael stopped at a convenience store to purchase a soda. Here he parked only briefly on the side of the street. Onwards to Penn State, he arrived at his office, physically turned in his grades to a colleague, then drove back home arriving to discover his wife at about 1.45 p.m. His alibi, for the most part, checked out. Fruit was found in a bag in the back seat of his car, ostensibly from the fruit stand at the market, though without any receipt to confirm when it was purchased or where it was from. The owner at the fruit stand did not recall seeing him that morning, though knew Raphael from other visits. He also had a parking ticket from his stop to purchase a soda, and cameras at the store captured him there. However, a walk from the parking lot to his office on campus 
revealed numerous stands and vending machines en route. Any one of these would have been more convenient than the store to have purchased a soda. His colleague subsequently confirmed that she spoke with him briefly when he turned in his grades. The exchange lasted no more than two minutes. Investigators also found that his drive home, which should have been 40 minutes with heavy traffic, must have taken him an hour. He claimed to have spent 40 minutes at the fruit stand, yet he was not recognized by the owner only hours later. Also extremely curious was Raphael's choice to call the local police station telephone directly instead of 911. Was his intention to avoid being recorded? He placed the call 20 minutes after arriving home and finding Ellen, though the path he took around the house could not have taken it nearly that amount of time. The professor's calculated story was not adding up. While Raphael sat in a marathon interview with investigators, an autopsy was performed on Ellen. The medical examiner had anticipated locating a gunshot wound, but quickly determined that this would not be the case. The defensive wounds on Ellen's arms could not have been caused by a gun. There was no gunshot. Raphael's initial statement to police over the phone that his wife's head was cracked was suspiciously accurate. The first impressions of law enforcement that originally worked the scene, with their cumulative years of experience, hadn't deduced what the economist had known with certainty. Ellen had been killed by multiple blunt force traumas to the head. It was thought that the murder weapon was likely a crowbar or similar object. It had been a heavy object, with a sharpened end. They determined that Ellen had been killed between 8.15 and 10.30 a.m leaving room within Raphael's window of time. This presented the very real possibility that the professor had committed the murder before he even left for work that morning. Friends of Ellen Robb did not hold back with their accusations. If it was murder, it was Raphael, they told police. There was no evidence that there had been physical abuse in the marriage, but according to those close to Ellen, Raphael did try to exert control over the relationship. Primarily, he did so with money. They had been unhappy for years. They slept in separate bedrooms. They had separate bank accounts, and they argued frequently. By Raphael's own admission, they had spoken about divorce so frequently over such a long period of time that he denied that it could possibly have been a trigger or motive for murder. They would fight. One of them would threaten divorce. Then, it never happened. This had been occurring since before their 12-year-old daughter was born. Indeed, Olivia's birth had been the single most significant factor keeping the couple together. According to Ellen's close friends and her brother Greg, things between the couple had been heating up leading to Christmas. Ellen had formally hired a divorce attorney who informed her that she was likely to receive 50 to 60% of her husband's assets in the split. She had also spoken with a realtor and agreed to rent a local three-bedroom townhouse, perfect for her and Olivia. The move-in date was set for mid-January. Raphael, however, denied being aware of any of these plans. The professor's ex-wife described him as meek and quiet, but obsessed with money. Detectives also discovered that he had quite a bit of it, despite what they also learned was Ellen's shopping addiction. In addition to the house valued at close to $400,000, which the professor kept in his name, he had opened multiple foreign bank accounts, across which he held almost $2.3 million. As the investigation was underway, they had confiscated his American passport. But they could not also hold his Israeli one. Raphael Robb was a very real flight risk. If their suspicions were correct and the economist had snapped and killed his wife, time could be running out to collect enough evidence to justify an arrest before he opted to leave the country. After a few days, Raphael was authorized to move back into his house with his daughter. And as investigators continued their work, he began to resume regular life. The grieving husband even attended Ellen's funeral, jumping into a place as a pallbearer unexpectedly, 
much to the shock and disgust of the mortars. After resettling at home, Raphael called both a glazier and a locksmith to address the damage done to the door and window. The men that came out for these tasks, however, were not tradesmen. They were undercover police officers. Struggling with only circumstantial evidence linking Raphael to the murder, investigators were keen to see if they could outsmart the game theorist, and maybe even catch him in an admission of guilt. The ruse was well planned. The undercover agent attempted to gain trust and build rapport with Raphael by admitting that he was not a glazier. He was on parole, he said, and was given the role as a favor from a friend. He couldn't fix the glass. His boss would do that. But he could offer advice about Raphael's legal predicament. The officer painted the lead investigator and the DA as cutthroat, officials that wouldn't play by the rules. If they had their sights set on Raphael, which he said they did, the professor would need to be equally aggressive to counter them. The story that a burglar killed his wife but did not steal anything wasn't going to fly, the undercover officer told him. He was going to have to, somehow, come up with a list of items that were stolen to support his story. Law enforcement believed that if the story was false, the professor would be in touch shortly with supposedly stolen items, and by extension, an indication of his guilt. Police waited to hear if Raphael had taken the bait. They hoped that a return by the fake tradesman could also pick up where they left off and elicit more details from Raphael. Perhaps he would trip up. But the professor never took the bait. Whether he knew they were undercover officers is unclear. But no list of items ever emerged, and although he spoke casually and openly with the officers on more than one occasion, Raphael never altered his story. The results from the crime lab provided law enforcement the confidence they required to move forward with an arrest. There were no unknown fingerprints identified in the house, only Ellen's and her husband's. The blood samples taken all matched to Ellen. The forensic team could not establish a third-party presence through DNA sampling anywhere in the crime scene. Raphael's elusive burglar, they determined, had not been in the house. The professor was arrested and charged with first and third degree murder, weapons possession, tampering with evidence, and giving a false report. If convicted, he faced life in prison without the possibility of parole. While held in custody without bond, Raphael hired a defense team composed of the state's most prestigious and successful criminal attorneys. They began to build a compelling case to establish reasonable doubt. There was no blood or related evidence found in Raphael's car, nor on any of his clothing. His office at the university was searched, and that also turned up nothing of evidentiary value. The drains were clean, and there were no signs of a cleanup. How plausible was it that he had beaten Ellen to death and left no trail? To his motive, his team stated simply that Raphael was not aware that Ellen had met with a divorce attorney. There was no paperwork, and they claimed he had no knowledge of her plans to move out the following month. And the alibi? Of course the owner of the fruit stand told the police that he had not seen him. Detectives lingering around the premises asking questions was bad for business. The owner had wished for the police to leave as quickly as possible, and so claimed he had not seen Raphael rob that day, when in fact, he almost certainly had, they argued. Much of the rest of his time had been accounted for. In addition to the doubts being laid out by the professor's team, the state was having issues bringing the pieces together. They knew that Raphael had owned one or two pairs of Timberland boots. He had been photographed in them years earlier and had verified they were his during his police interview. If he still owned them, he told investigators, they would be in his bedroom. But police could not locate the shoes. The footprint left by the killer did not match any pattern within law enforcement databases, so they determined that the boots must have been a foreign purchase that they had not yet recorded. But more alarmingly for their case, the size of the print in the kitchen did not align to their accused killer. They were too small to fit Raphael's standard size 12 feet. 
Regardless of the inconsistencies, the prosecutors pushed on. They planned to present the testimony of an expert psychiatrist who was prepared to testify that the murder was a crime of passion. By extension, the murder could only have been committed by someone close to Ellen, and not, as the defense claimed, a complete stranger who broke into the house. The defense says today they want to prevent expert testimony from psychiatrists and psychologists on the prosecution side from ever being admitted into court. The killing was designed to obliterate her and her alone from the face of the earth. Uh, obviously, the defense objects to that because he certainly has a motive to want to do that, and I certainly can see how they would consider that to be devastating evidence. Pre-trial discussions surrounding this witness and threats on both sides to repeatedly appeal any decisions that did not rule in their favor meant that the game theorist was facing years in custody before the case would even go to trial. It was at this stage that Raphael began to recalculate. Instead of fighting the charges, he opted for a plea deal. If the murder was a crime of passion and not planned down to the last detail, an offer of voluntary manslaughter from the state seemed appropriate. It was to this charge that Raphael Robb finally admitted guilt. It would carry a sentence of 10 to 20 years in prison. But for someone without any criminal history of any kind, the term was likely to be reduced further. In November 2007, Raphael took the stand to confess. He stated that it was not the money he would lose in the divorce, nor his wife's shopping addiction that had motivated him, but an argument over the care of their daughter, Olivia. As the exchange grew heated, Ellen had stood and pushed him, Raphael claimed. In the heat of the moment, he had grabbed an exercise bar meant to be installed for chin-ups from the living room. This bar was heavy, but circular and blunt. Then, he just started swinging, he said. Afterwards, the professor took off all of his clothing and boots in the bedroom, placed them in a bag to dispose of, and dressed for work. The confession was accepted. He was sentenced to a 10-year term, with the possibility of parole after just five years. The state prosecutors, approaching an election and uncertain of the strength of their case, believed they had made a sensible decision. Ellen's family, however, disagreed. They believed that the murder had been premeditated. Raphael Robb was both an intelligent and deceitful individual. His decisions were always calculated. It was unlikely that he had not planned the crime in advance. This was the argument put forward when the family filed a civil suit against Raphael, seeking damages for Olivia. It also offered an opportunity to have their day in court. At the civil trial, they argued that Raphael's confession was a lie, designed to fit the description of manslaughter, but inconsistent with the facts. To prove their theory, they pointed to a piece of evidence largely ignored by the original investigators. In the trunk of Raphael's car was a hazmat suit, brand new, still in its packaging. It was unclear why an economist would need a full-body suit designed to protect someone from hazardous materials. If he had one of these items, was it not possible that he had already made use of another one? If Raphael had put on one of these suits in the garage before entering the house, and then removed and disposed of it back in the garage afterwards, it would explain both the trail back to the garage and the lack of blood found everywhere else. But what about the murder weapon? Had he also armed himself in advance? In the garage, there was a rack on the wall that held a place for eight tools. Between a shovel and a rake, there was one place on the rack with a tool missing. Five years before her death, Ellen's brother Art had helped her to organize their garage. In that place had been a crowbar, Art stated. But after the murder, it was missing. The burden of proof in a civil trial is less than in a criminal court. But the case put forward arguing that Ellen's murder had been thoroughly planned and executed, not a sudden crime of passion, was compelling. A jury has awarded more than $124 million to the daughter of a former Penn professor convicted of killing his wife, her mom. It was far more than her father could ever pay, but an amount that provided a form of justice that she and her extended family had sought. After serving five years in prison, Raphael Robb was granted parole. 
Two months later, Ellen's family was informed of the decision. It doesn't appear that they followed the law, uh, and the law seems pretty clear. Uh, I was prosecutor for 10 years, uh, been a lawyer for a little while here, and, you know, it seems real clear to me that victims shall be afforded that opportunity uh, to present, uh, you know, evidence to that parole board. And in this case, that didn't happen. Ellen's brother, Gary Gregory, and others were incensed by the decision to release Raphael Robb after only five short years and without being heard by the parole board. So they began lobbying. In conjunction with state representatives, they applied pressure on the board's decision, arranged a meeting of their own, and forced a reconsideration. In an unprecedented turn of events, months after being granted release, the professor's parole was rescinded. To Mr. Robb is that this is the captain speaking, and your flight to freedom has been canceled. Perspective, uh, we want to make sure that our victims have the same right to the jurors, meaning the parole members. We want to make sure that the victims have the same right that these criminal thugs have. Raphael Robb served another five years in prison after his parole was revoked, completing his 10-year sentence. He was released from prison in January 2017. He can't simply go back into society unfettered while this, the memory of my sister fades away. After his release, he moved to a suburb of Pittsburgh. It is understood that Olivia Robb ended all contact with her father after his imprisonment. Gary Gregory, with the support of his family, successfully lobbied for new legislation, making it a requirement for parole boards to consult with victims and their families before a convict is potentially released. The new legislation is called Ellen's Law. And that was the tragic case of Ellen Gregory Robb and her calculating and devious husband. Thanks for watching. I'm Kevin. This is Just Thought Lounge, and I'll see you in the next one.